pleased to welcome Dr. Shui Huang, um, an associate professor in the Department of Industrial <laughs> Systems Engineering at the University of Washington. Uh, he received a bachelor's degree in statistics from the School of Gifted Young at the University of Science and Technology of China in 2007. His PhD from Arizona State University. He also has an adjunct appointment with the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education and the Integrated Brain Imaging Center at the University of Washington. He develops methodologies for modeling, monitoring, diagnosis, and prognosis of complex network, sy network systems, such as brain connectivity networks and disease progression process of multiple stages and pathways. He also develops, develops statistical and data mining models to integrate massive and heterogeneous data sets, such as neuroimaging, genomics, proteomics, laboratory tests, demographics, clinical variables for facilitating scientific discoveries in biomedical research and for better making decisions in clinical practice. So thank you very much for traveling all the way out to be with us today and we look forward to your talk. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and to uh, uh, share with, with you guys about my research work. Uh, so as you probably noticed, my title is really uh, not the best one. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually two parts because I was trying to figure out a uh, unified uh, thing so I can put everything together, but I end up with these two parts because uh, these are really the two parts I can uh, put my two categories I can put my works uh, in, and I can um, the method we developed. And I mean, it's I mean there are so many other questions there still there. So I, um, hopefully I will have a, a good discussion about how what's the what's the exciting uh, what's could be done in this field. So uh, first of all, I want to give an overview of my research. Uh, roughly speaking, I organize um, uh, my uh, organized healthcare research into four pillars. One is uh, the bench, bedside, community, and policy. So bench mostly concerns with uh, basic biologists uh, who work on trying to understand the uh, basic mechanism of a disease like a cancer, how the can how the uh, cancer actually uh, start from the, uh, the genetics on the uh, or probably on the cellular level. So after that, we have the bad side, which is how we are actually the clinicians uh, try uh, how we can actually better deliver the uh, treatment options to uh, uh, to be in the hospitals in different clinical settings. And then it's community. Uh, it's we concern a population of patients, uh, how we can actually best uh, deliver all the uh, treatments we can take care of this patient, like uh, let's say the type one diabetes patient of uh, here, and how we can actually better manage their conditions. And then there is our policy level, which is how we uh, make up best policy to promote health in the uh, in the national level. So uh, you can see that it's uh, it's a rough division of the healthcare works and their translational process from. Uh, the bench to bedside, bedside community, and community to policy. So to connect those, to facilitate those translations, there are some many data sets right now. Uh, like for example here, uh, this one is actually um, um, how, how can I actually use this? Uh, so, yes, here? Yeah. No. So, uh, Sorry. So this is actually uh, like uh, the um, microarray image, and this is a brain image of the scan of the human brain. So in the bench side, we can ask a lot of questions, like let's say for Alzheimer's disease, um, for we can take images of the disease patient, and we can compare that with normal aging people, and we can see how the disease actually disrupts the uh, the brain network for the uh, for normal functioning, and then we can extract uh, some biomarkers. Uh, to monitor the disease progression. And so this can be done in both the bench side and the bad side, because in the bench side we're more interested on the mechanism, but on the bad side we're more interested on the quantitative uh, track of this uh, disease progression. So this data set provides those bridges, and which give us opportunities to, uh, uh, to facilitate the translation. So basically those are the data sets that I work with, and uh, in recent years we also have uh, the emerging technologies like, uh, um, like some uh, smartphone apps, we can uh, create those apps to uh, facilitate the uh, delivery. For example, this Empower is an app we created. Um, it's, uh, the PI is a surgeon herself. So she, uh, her idea is we have so many surgical patients, and they actually spend a lot of time in the hospital. A lot of them, they're not going to have a complications. So we can actually uh, put them back home or in other facilities, and we can leave the hospital resource to uh, the new patients. But on the other hand, we don't want to lose track of those patients, so we can use smartphone apps, ask them to take uh, images of their own, as this uh, graph shows. And 
if we can have a computer vision algorithm to extract the uh, wound related characteristics to identify uh, which patient actually had high risk, we can actually uh, call them back, we can have a nurse to take care of their case. So uh, this is kind of a remote monitoring those uh, the patients. So this is basically the, uh, the framework. Um, so with those data sets, we can actually facilitate the transition between reactive care to preventive care. Uh, so the uh, preventive care more focused on if we can predict the progression of the patients. So for example, this graph is a conceptual disease model of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And this curve is too small, so I need to uh, interpret that for you. So this curve is uh, for normal aging. So we know that uh, uh, with aging, we, uh, the memory function, the other functions, they decline. But for the Alzheimer's disease patient, this curve is particularly fast because uh, there's some pathological change in, in the brain structure. So if we can actually understand the disease and accurately predict map of the project of progression trajectory, we can actually detect um, severe outcomes beforehand, and then we can uh, actually provide uh, apply preventive treatments to slow down uh, to make this uh, aging process as smooth as possible. So this is uh, one idea. Another one is like for depression patient, uh, like this is the PHQ9 score of those patients. Uh, PHQ9 score reflects the severity of the disease. So if we can understand what, why different people, they have different symptoms of depression, like they exhibit different patterns, we can actually manage them um, uh, according to their particular trajectories. So those ideas, based on the idea that we can have an um, accurate uh, mapping out of the progression trajectory, and this one is a simplified conceptual framework, but how we can actually use data to do that is actually the key. So if we can do that, we can, uh, we can, uh, have, we can do better prognostics, we can have better monitoring. Like, for example, right now for depression patients, uh, the routine is every three months uh, the patient came back for revisit, but uh, this is actually not flexible for uh, everybody. So some people, they may come back uh, more frequent, some people, they may not need that. So this is uh, how we can actually deal with the monitoring. And the intervention is how we can actually prevent uh, bad things happening before that. For example, for Alzheimer's disease, Nowadays, we have those imaging technique to scan the brain, and we can detect the amyloid. Uh, it's a toxic protein in the human brain. So that if we apply drugs to clean those uh, proteins, it probably can uh, slow down the progression process. So this is the, uh, how we uh, industrial engineer actually can uh, help those uh, disease management as, because we have all the data, and we can have the model to model this uh, process. The process is the disease progression, and we can have this uh, better organized how we take care of these patients. Okay, so uh, so this is a uh, uh, so this is the goal. So as I said, there are so many there right now, and the uh, techniques the, like the smartphones we provide the tool for us to do that. Um, so this is actually a, a medicalized smartphone. It's a concept uh, provided by uh, this book. Uh, this is uh, I purple is actually a physician uh, uh, who wrote this book, and this is the uh, the figure in this uh, in this uh, book. He actually mentioned that. The smartphones is not only really just for communication, but they can it provides a um, uh, microprocessor and also display functions. And nowadays, people create all kinds of devices which can be attached to the smartphone. And also, by the smartphone itself, it has a lot of sensors like GPS, accelerometers, and the Wi-Fi connection. When you walk into a room, you actually uh, connect with the Wi-Fi, and it actually tells you a lot of information about the movement. We can also have some. Uh, message, uh, your phone call, your audio signal, so all kinds of th signals we can actually collect. And this sensor base continuously enhanced with other apps with uh, the uh, medical device you can actually have. So notice like you can have an app to uh, take your measurement of your breast or scan your uh, eyes and uh, scan your skin. So like our app will scan your own image so it can tell you a lot of information about the person. And patient-wise, this is a tool for better engagement of patients, and people increasingly seek new ways to, uh, to get health care information and how to take out the, um, uh, the conditions. So I'll give you two examples that I feel really interesting. Uh, one is the, um, uh, like this paper actually was years ago, but they actually um, have a method which is to <coughs> extract the heart rates from your video, uh, if you look, if you have a video of your uh, of your face, you actually uh, figure out what your heart rate could be. So uh, this is because uh, your heart rate actually induces color change of your uh, of your image. So 
probably we cannot see that, but the computer can see that. When we draw the color histogram, we can actually see uh, delta variability. So that can help us to monitor the heart rate. So, so the new technology is not just to collect uh, existing data in a, in a new way, but it actually creates a new type of data. And actually, uh, uh, we leave a lot of trees in the um, measurement we actually not aware of. Another example is actually, uh, this is a paper published on uh, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is just a short story, just one or two pages. But I find that this is really interesting. Uh, the, there was this professor, uh, he works in this hospital and uh, there was a fellow. The, uh, the group of physicians tried to figure out what's the diagnosis of uh, a very rare disease. They look at the laboratory tests and the numbers look really don't add up. So they had difficulty to do the diagnosis. And then the fellow gave a correct diagnosis which verified the data. So the professor asked the fellow, how do you get that? And the fellow said, I type all the laboratory tests in Google and I find that. So, so it actually tells you uh, there's so much information there and uh, it's, we know even how to use that, how we can actually dig it out. So this is the, um, there's another promising area I feel like uh, there, there are also discussions among the medical community about how they actually uh, can cope with these uh, new opportunities to uh, utilize the data for better healthcare. So, um, so this is the uh, background of my research and also the, uh, the things I find really exciting. Uh, so today, um, in terms of the topics, I will focus on two topics. One is the, uh, our new method for personalization in disease modeling and monitoring. So this relates to the, uh, uh, the, the big picture I'm going to revisit that later. So how you reconstruct uh, the envision disease trajectory of each person. Then you can um, optimize your disease modeling and monitoring for that person. The second topic is a uh, more application-driven problem. Uh, it's detection of depression from communication. So this one, we use existing method to uh, try to uh, see whether or not we can actually detect patient, uh, a depressed patient from, by the way they talk. So this is uh, uh, the second topic. So uh, and then I will give a highlights of, of my other works and give a conclusion. So during my uh, presentation, if you have any questions, you can just uh, feel free to ask. Okay. Right. So this is the uh, yeah. So I said we uh, the personal uh, the uh, the first topic is about how we reconstruct this uh, is this trajectory for each individual. Okay. So uh, this is just I mean for this graph, this is just conceptual and it's also on the population level. But in reality, we have to combine individual data and try to construct an individual model to help, to help, help us make decisions. So I want to give a, a brief overview of how we can actually uh, uh, reconstruct a uh, disease trajectory. So for example, uh, here is a simple illustration, like for example, in the, uh, for each patient, we have, we have the patient's medical records. Uh, for example, if this is depression, we have the PHQ9 score of this patient over time, so you can have the red dots over time there. And then we fit a smooth curve, so this is kind of uh, how we uh, reconstruct the trajectory of the patient. But this is, uh, if this is an existing uh, um, uh, baseline method that people use, and if you have enough data for each patient, and if the data is high quality, if they are sampled frequently, and number size is good, then you can have a fairly good model. But in reality, this is not, and particularly for a lot of cases, we don't have this kind of uh, global index for severity. So, for example, for um, depression, we use PHQ9 score, but PHQ9 score is a subjective measurement, and it's also um, uh, only ten questions. So, uh, ten questions. So, we have this uh, a limitation to measure that. So, the data fusion approach can help us to convert this uh, um, a lot of personal information to create those index. So, like for example, here is we uh, we have three patients, and we can convert the patient's data set at this time point to create a global index set here, and then another one, another one, another one. So for each patient, we can use data fusion method, which uh, we have some works here, but I'm not going to talk about that today. But this is the first step. We create those global index of the patient. And then the next step is how can we actually build up the trajectory model for each individual. So this is the, the goal for that. But you can see that this is really a challenging goal because for example, for the patient with the red, curve, red dots, it has measurements on this uh, time segment, also measurement at this time segment, but other than that, we don't have any information, right? But for this patient with the blue dots, 
it has the information at these time segments, but not at the others. So they have a different pieces. So this is a, this is the trade-off. You have a smartphone, you have a, you have other ways to take measurements, but it's not a well-controlled clinical trials. So we cannot control the uh, time frequency and the particular time point to collect what type of measurement. So how to do what what you what we have, right? So my message concerns how we build up the personal models by putting all the data together. So here is um, a conceptual map of this, uh, how we can actually do that. So the goal is to build up the individual models. Let's say we have n patients, so we want to build the individual models for each of them. But there are two extremes. One is one size fits all model, which is we put all the data set together will be the one model, which means if you go back to this figure, we just remove the color and you take those data points as came from one person or one population, and then you fit one curve for that. So that works for population decision making, but for individualized, this is actually lost the individual the generic of that. So this is one extreme. Another extreme is we build a fully individualized model, which means for each person, we only use the person's data sets, and we can definitely do that. But the uncertainty for each individual model is large. So in this case, it's too complex, which means you build so many models. So we try to create a middle ground, and we actually are the, we create a population knowledge base. We call it the Kalani models. And we, let's say we have K Kalani models, and each Kalani model represents a phenotype of a, of, a, of a disease. So and each person has a population membership coming from these uh, Kalani models. So in that case, we create a middle ground, and we learn parameters of the Kalani models as also the membership vectors of these individuals belonging to those uh, Kalani models. So this way, we provide a structure to, uh, to build those individual models. So a note for this is actually I, the reason we, we had this idea is I worked with Professor Ancient, and we actually had a similar problem on the wind turbines. When you build up a personal models for wind turbines, you also have this kind of uh, difficulty to do that. So this is a similarity between healthcare application and these uh, wind turbine applications. So to uh, model that, we uh, this is the formulation we have. Uh, rough, yeah, question. Are the membership vectors yeah. known, or are some, or are there cases where you might only know some memberships, but others are not known? Right now, we just assume unknown, so we learn that okay. from data. Great. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So. This is a uh, um, so this is uh, so when we say the conceptual framework here, we didn't really I mean talk about what's the specific model, but this is, is a generic framework which can be applied to different models. So in that presentation, I'm going to talk about two type of models. Uh, one is a um, this a smooth curve trajectory, and other one is a multiple based model. So uh, both can be applied. So here is uh, the uh, general formulation of if we talk about a smooth trajectory of the disease. Uh, so this first part is the Goodness of fit for each individual. We put all the individuals together, and this is the uh, global index for the individual, the time series, and this is the fit curve. So this is partly just measure how good is the, uh, the model fit out. And this part is the um, uh, the, uh, the uh, similarity regularization, which means we can use some covariance of the patient to reconstruct the similarity of the patient, and if the patient are similar with each other, their membership vector should be similar with each other. So this is uh, how we are. Uh, uh, formulated the problem this way. And then the membership vectors, they have to be uh, non-negative and add together equal to one. So this is the constraints. And for some applications, we uh, assume they can only models, they can only take positive values. For example, the, uh, in the uh, Alzheimer's disease, when you take the uh, MMAC score of the patient, it, it ranges from zero to 30, so it cannot be negative values. So you can have all this constraint in your model. And then you train the model, you get the parameters of the canonic models, and also parameters of the membership vectors. Okay. So we, uh, I skipped the uh, methodological uh, details about how we solve the algorithm, uh, but I show you some applications. So one application we did is for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, our data set came from a publicly available data set, Alzheimer's disease new imaging initiative. So this is a, a, a huge data set for Alzheimer's disease. And in our collection, we collect 478 subjects when we perform this study. And uh, the global index we use here is the uh, ADS, uh, the MMAC score. So uh, this is probably too small. I show a snapshot of what MMAC score looks like. But it actually uh, asks you, like, the first question is, what's the year? What's the season? Uh, 
The second question is where are we now? So ask these kind of questions, and if, it, if they are, and then you have a scale for each, and then you add them up, so the scale is one to thirty. So a uh, uh, model using the literature to model the uh, longitudinal uh, trajectory of this uh, the MMSD, is some, one model is like this model, it's a second degree polynomial model. So we use that model as well, and we try to build up the, uh, the uh, personalized model for all the individuals. So one thing I want to mention is that for this uh, 478 subjects, it actually has three groups. One, one is the normal aging individuals, which is the control group, uh, that's 104. And then we have the uh, disease group, is 133 patients. And between that, we have a mild cognitive impairment, we call MSCI group, which are not officially diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease yet, but they have shown some symptoms uh, of uh, dementia. So this is kind of the transition uh, transition stage. So because our model is trying to identify the canonical structure, so before we uh, uh, train the model, we didn't tell the algorithm there are three, uh, three groups. So we just put all the images together and build the model. So we use cost validation to decide what's the, uh, what's the best number for the canonical structures, and we actually identify three canonical models as the best, and those are the three uh, uh, canonical models looks like in terms of the trajectory. So we also compile the model with uh, existing models, like individualized model, which is the, uh, the one string I mentioned. We build one model for each of them. And the, uh, another model is just with uh, uh, this model is the mixed effect model, which is the, uh, uh, to try to assume there is a one center tendency of all the, dis uh, all, the, all the models. And therefore, each model is just some kind of uh, derivation from the center tendency. And that derivation is controlled by a normal distribution. So in this case, we compile the prediction accuracy, and we can actually really, we can actually build a more accurate prediction model based on this uh, uh, canonical structure of these uh, data sets. And we also apply that for depression data sets. Uh, this is came from the Mental Health Research Network. We has uh, a larger number of uh, subjects. So um, uh, this subject, we have the PHQ9 score. So these are uh, the, uh, the nine items of the PHQ9. Uh, so we, you can have uh, this. Uh, uh, quantitative information of the patient over time. And for some of the patients, we have uh, a few data points, like this, we have six, and it is not uh, regularly uh, sampled. And for some of them, we have a, a regularly sampled, so the quality uh, are quite different. So in this case, we have this uh, um, a depressed patient, and we use the uh, arrivals, and which identify the five groups, and they actually show different patterns, like this, this group, the severity is always high, but this group is always low, and some people they actually fluctuate over time. So you can categorize the patient into uh, different categories, and you can use the model to predict uh, what's the risk of their next uh, severe outcome of their condition. So this is how we uh, apply the current structure to develop a new model based on these uh, smooth trajectories. So um, any questions so far? Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, the, 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 this learning framework is generic. Uh, as long as you have a um, mathematical model for each individual, you can uh, come up with a learning algorithm to, uh, uh, to use the current structure. So we also extend the model to a uh, macro disease model. So for example, the depression, uh, again, the same data set. We don't use the uh, smooth curve anymore, but we categorize the pH class score into five states. So like one to four is minimum, um, no minimal risk, and 22, 27 is severe risk. So you categorize the patient into five states and you come up with uh, the structure of this model. So then we can uh, apply the uh, algorithm for the macro decision process as well. So here is one simple illustration of this, uh, how this works. Uh, this requires a lot of uh, assumptions for the modeling because, for example, if, as illustrated here, you have two states, uh, two kind of models, um, health state, disease state, and you can see that the transition probability is illustrated uh, with these numbers. And then we can say we have uh, one individual, the membership structure belonging to this category is 8%, belonging to this is 3%. Then we just use the median weights uh, to multiply this, weight with this, and we get the transition probability. So this provides a numerical uh, connection to connect those uh, models so we can learn that. So uh, we uh, come up with the uh, uh, optimization formulation. So this is basically following the, uh, the idea. The first turn is to measure the uh, model fit. Second turn is to regularize the model similarity for that. 
And then, well, we apply that for the, uh, uh, the, for the same depression data set, and we are, I'm going to show you some results later. So this is one extension we can work uh, if you work on your disease. If you, you may have a different disease model, but you can use this uh, learning framework to come up with your algorithm to create a personalization model. <coughs> So another uh, ongoing work we are doing right now is we are trying to uh, um, scale it up, scale this up. So let's say we have millions of patients, and if we have millions of patients, if you still look at this original scheme, um, the counting models could be thousands of them. So that's still too many of that. So we can actually take these counting models as the new level of individual models, and then you apply the counting the counting model again. So it's just like illustrated here. The first level, you apply those, you get those kind of models. Then you can go up, and then you go up. So we make it a deep model, so you can actually learn uh, a deep um, kind, of, uh, kind of models here. So this is uh, somehow similar like a hierarchical clustering. So when we do clustering, uh, the first node is include every data point, and then you split into two parts, and then you split into two parts. But this is, we build up a bottom up, but the hierarchical clusters are done, but the idea is that very similar. You organize your data generality in this way. Right? So this is how uh, uh, we are working on right now. The challenge is how we computationally solve the problem. So in deep learning, there are many algorithms help us to robustify the learning. So um, this is how we can scale up this. So moving forward, so be on top of the disease modeling, we also can use that for decision making. Um, so here is what we are so far. We have the individuals, we build up individual trajectory models. And then the next step, for example, we are trying to talk about, um, identify what's the best monitoring strategy. So like for this guy, um, this patient may come back earlier because the disease is more severe. But for this patient, maybe come back later because it's more stable. So we need to de decide the personal monitoring frequency for the uh, for for this patient. So based on this um, personalized trajectory modeling, we come up with this uh, um, this control loop. We can uh, use that to uh, monitor the patient. So you can see that with the historical data set, we use our cover learning, and you get the prognostics for the individuals, and then you rank this patient based on their prognostics, and you decide which patient you should, uh, should take new measurement, call those patients back, or if the patient is up, you assign a nurse to the patient, and the nurse can review those materials, like review the own image, and uh, identify whether or not this patient really has infection should be uh, revisited the hospital. So with the new information, you can update your medical information, update the patient information, and then you update their models again. So this one is we uh, build a prediction model for each individual, and we identify the sensory strategy for each individual. So we keep them the information, we keep their status clear. So in our um, Empower app, this is what we hope to achieve in the end. We have uh, this kind of uh, um, control system in the back end, so we can uh, monitor those patients and uh, make sure that we didn't lose any uh, signal undetect. So this is the, uh, the idea of that. So this is the first topic, um, and um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Otherwise, we can uh, move forward to the second one. Yeah? For the trajectories of Alzheimer's, what were the characteristics of the people in each uh, trajectory? Were there kind of things in the covariate matrix that made them? Um, there covariates that. You mean like uh, what do you mean by the characteristics? So like, is it older people or the ones that are? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Uh, right now we didn't uh, look at that as that because we they uh, we could use the covariates to predict like the uh, trajectory what the trajectory looks like, but we didn't do that right now. We use the covariates to define the similarity information. Which is uh, we use the new imaging, we use the demographics to define the similarity between uh, patients. Right. I guess yeah. I'm saying, did you kind of see natural like clusters or something? Uh, yes, they do have the natural cluster like I'm showing here, but right now it's more cluster based on the groups. But age is definitely an important factor, but there are also other factors. Right. Like education level is also an important factor there. Yeah. And genetic factors, a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so um, yeah, so this is uh, the um, current works we have done in this aspect. So the second topic is detection of depression from communication. So give me one example of what that this means. Um, actually, if you take a video of yourself, you can actually um, uh, there are some existing apps already, so you can actually take the uh, evaluation of your emotion. So something like that. So in this case, we are trying to. Uh, detect whether or not we can uh, identify depression patterns from a person, how a person talk, how a person communicate with each other. So this is a data set publicly available. Uh, if you're interested, you can also uh, apply for the, a few of the data. So this is um, um, our framework. So we um, look at the communication. We uh, like there are some um, face expression, and also how a person, what's the vocabulary for the person. And also, what the audio, like the speech patterns, how we can actually uh, quantify, categorize those, and then we can build up a prediction model to uh, detect what's the depression. Um, so, I mentioned that for depression work, previously we used the PHQ 9 for the uh, trajectory modeling. So, here's the thing we are trying to use this uh, video, text, audio variables to predict what's the um, uh, PHQ 9 of those uh, participants. So for those participants, some of them are diagnosed as depressed, some of them are not as controlled. So uh, we can actually do a comparison. So this is our computational pipeline. As I mentioned, this is our application training work. So we didn't create a new message, but we used the existing method to create a pipeline to uh, uh, process the data. So like for the speech patterns, we are uh, using the processing. And after we extract all the patterns, uh, the features, we use a random forest to build a, uh, build a prediction model based on this modality alone. And for the um, face expression, we use uh, computer vision algorithms. So it's very interesting to know that um, the human face can be codified as you have those muscles on your, on your face, and you can have those points. And if, I, uh, if you have an emotion, and you can actually define that as a co-activation of multiple coordinates. So it's actually codify. It's a way to quantify emotion. It probably not. I mean, it's it's a way to quantify. It's not just to be. Uh, uh, it's not to define, but you can actually calculate that uh, in a certain degree. And the transcript we can use. Any question? Yeah. Is there any particular reason you use random forest for this application? Uh, no particular reason. I just performance is good. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So the transcript, we can uh, we can uh, look at the uh, speech patterns, like uh, we can tell uh, whether or not there is a high prevalence of a uh, non-pause, uh, slow speech, and also we can uh, have there is like existing depression-related vocabulary. Like depressed people, they tend to uh, use those words. Uh, there, this also is um, uh, some uh, some research has already collect those words. So we can actually analyze the transcript to identify what's the frequency of the words used uh, for, the, uh, for this uh, participant. So that creates another text feature. So with, with all this together, we can uh, build the prediction models. And then eventually, uh, we put all the trees together to make a prediction for that. So there's so many. Uh, the, the fun part of this research is really uh, to test the concept, because uh, the signal here, communication, is really uh, a complex object, so it has a lot of questions to ask. So right now we just collect what's available for us to calculate this process. So like for example, for the audio, we collect a, a lot of uh, technical term, uh, technical uh, features in signal processing. And honestly, uh, right now we're not able to map all each of those technical concepts with some intuitive concept to actually define communication. But right now we just focus on the numerical performance and identify and, and uh, create a list as rich as possible. So uh, this is the, uh, the so some of you may know for the audio analysis, we can analyze the signal in, in both the time domain and the frequency domain, so you can create a lot of uh, uh, biomarkers. So for the uh, this is description in the time domain and the description of the frequency domain, those are some examples. And for the uh, uh, Facial expression, we can uh, define, as I mentioned, there are some facial coordinates. So basically, we look at head movements, like a person is talking, uh, his, her head is actually has some uh, movements. So you can actually, if you define coordinates, uh, if the head is moving, uh, you can actually see the area 
uh, you draw a point and you can calculate the area, right? So if I uh, move a lot, if the area is very large, right? So um, that's the uh, head movement, and also we can calculate distance uh, by markers right? because if you define the coordinates, you can actually see uh, how this distance actually changes uh, when person talks. Um, like the uh, distance between the three idols, so that's uh, uh, that's also we find is very important. So this is actually uh, the features we can, cre uh, can create based on the uh, um, the uh, face recognition um, uh, method. So another part is the text. So as I mentioned, we can calculate uh, the frequency of uh, a non-pause, a slow pitch, speech patterns, and the linguistic habits like the vocabulary. So we can create also uh, features for this uh, aspect as well. So eventually, we put things together and we uh, identify, uh, we compare the model with individual model only. Like visual only is which means the model is based on the visual data only, and the audio only is audio only. So we found out if you put all the modalities together based on the test data set, its performance is indeed is uh, the error, the error is lower. So this is uh, uh, how we can actually um, um, uh, demonstrate the if you put everything together, it's definitely better. But we are not sure I mean how and why they are better because we really don't know what's the mechanism there. But this is the first step we can prove numerically that's probably significant. We also find an interesting thing is we can we can uh, include a gender variable and that makes a big difference. So which means when we make a prediction, we create one more variable, uh, whether or not the, uh, what's the gender of this participant, and then we can see the prediction accuracy of the of the model is actually improved. So later we actually identify for, uh, for male and female their uh, top biomarkers are kind of uh, uh, have a similarity, but also there are some interesting difference there. So uh, another part of the uh, of the interesting part of this study is we actually create uh, we try to connect those technical terms with uh, some intuitive terms how we define a uh, person part of what the what communication looks like. So for example, for this uh, this are the reference we identified which are actually associated with like, the envelope associated with the pitch and the silence. So those are the things uh, help us to uh, correlate. What the uh, our funding can uh, correlate with the intuitive knowledge of that. So uh, let's look look into the result more. If we start, so for example, if we look at the audio biomarkers for the female, um, you can see that MFCC is actually show up at the first, uh, most significant. But MFCC is not that significant for the males. And if you go back to the uh, literature reference we identified, MFCC here is associated with pitch and the silence. Uh, so measure that two aspects in, 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 in this way, and it's also uh, associated with the pause and anger. So MFCC is a category of features. So we can actually see that uh, the significance in the male is quite I mean, uh, another. So this is the one thing we have identified. But other than that, they do share a lot of uh, similarities. This is just top five, but we have some uh, uh, a long list for these uh, features we identified. There are also video biomarkers, and you can see that like a left eye distance, right eye distance, uh, they show up on top of this uh, of this uh, result, and that means these uh, facial expressions you can really detect or uh, have a feeling of uh, a person is uh, depressed or not. Yeah, the same for the text biomarkers. So we can uh, see that the, num the number of lovers divided by the number of words, which actually is a way to measure how frequently a person smiles or laughs uh, during the conversation. So this is also, we find out for the female is significant, for male is not. So, uh, yeah. so it's, it's hard to interpret or to make a theory of that, but this is what we observed uh, from this analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the uh, the, uh, the the this uh, the second topic. How we actually detect the depression from the communication. So as I mentioned, that this is really a a, a big question, and I don't think we our current work can answer that. But uh, then, but our current work is the first step. We demonstrate that there are ways we can actually answer those questions uh, in new ways. So. Uh, we can, uh, there's so much more work to be done in that area. So in terms of that, related works like uh, people uh, look at the social media data, like the Twitter data, and, uh, and the, the current state of the art is they can predict uh, depression users from Twitter with the accuracy as high as uh, close to 90%. So those are the uh, very interesting progress uh, made in these areas. So. Uh, I want to give some highlights of my other works. Uh, for example, we, um, 
Uh, this is the app we uh, developed to call the Empower. Uh, is to uh, the idea, as I briefly mentioned before, is for a patient to take the only image of their uh, by themselves, so they can upload the image. We hopefully we can have an algorithm in the back end to analyze the images, and we can and further we can recommend um, uh, identify the top risk patients, so we can prioritize how the nurse and the physician should be, uh, surgeons should be take a review of those uh, case. So this one, we, the app is already, so we call that a lot, of app, a lot of apps is actually from computational to practice, which means we already have an algorithm, then we, have, we create an app to in practice, but for our app, it's, uh, it's, it's, apps, it's other way around. We, we have the app first, and then we try to create a computational algorithm for that. So. Uh, this is because the PI of this app, she's a surgeon, so she has this great idea of how we actually are uh, uh, alleviate the burden of the of the surgical patients because they actually stay in the hospital for a long time and they actually recovering well, so we should uh, put them back home. So, but we should create a communication tool like this tool. We can actually monitor them. So, in this case, we right now we are working on the computation uh, computation algorithms and also the personalization tools I presented here could be useful in this app. On the other hand, the difficulty is we know deep learning is very successful in uh, like images. Like images that have, have millions of uh, human face, so you can train the model well. But in this application, we don't have so many good quality uh, owned images. Particularly if you have those owned images, you don't have uh, labels, which means when you train the algorithm, you have to have a segmentation of this one area, and then you gather the algorithm to identify, oh, this is a, a labeled area, so you should predict that, but not those other areas. So basically, that means we need to have, a, let's say, a million of own images, and also we have a high quality segmentation of those wounds, which means we have to have surgeons to do that, right? So this is the, uh, the future goal we are hoping to, uh, to do that, and that's there are already some public available old images, and we are uh, what we are testing our preliminary algorithms on that. And on the other hand, we are uh, actually create uh, uh, another. We can experiment with, with this app with some uh, ideas. So, for example, if the um, AI algorithm cannot predict the bones in the end, what can we do, right? So, in this case, we are uh, we also experiment with idea of called uh, car sourcing. So, which means we, if AI cannot do that, but a human can do that, right? So, crowdsourcing, uh, like Amazon Mechanical Turk, which some of you may know that. If you don't know that, you can actually uh, Google that Amazon Mechanical Turk AMT. So, if you have a book, let's say it's in Chinese, I want to translate that into English, uh, I can pay, let's say, $1,000, and the book has uh, 300 pages. So, I can upload the book in Amazon Mechanical Turk. And I can pay, let's say, ten dollars uh, an hour in the, um, in the in the car sourcing platform, and people from all over the world they can actually uh, take one page, take two pages, and translate that and submit the work and get paid. So this is how the car sourcing works. Uh, so this idea we explore is we upload the own image in the car sourcing platform and ask people those are all um, anonymous people and they, some of them have a medical background and some of them don't have, but they can read those. Uh, Images to say whether or not this person has an infection there. So in our study, we find that out of the 2,000 participants, uh, the, the group has medical background and the group has no medical background. They have no difference, no statistical difference. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, so that's a good part. The bad part is they are equally bad, so they cannot be that Yeah. So, uh, but but that's promising because uh, still we can figure out uh, this is a technique. This is a technique we can actually utilize in the future. So you can integrate computer vision and the human together to make uh, uh, to make this uh, uh, wonderful app work. So this is um, um, this side. Another work I uh, want to highlight is uh, recent work we did is. Um, uh, it's well with sense, let's say this is uh, a type 1 diabetes patient, uh, this is a glucose monitoring app. So you can actually monitor the glucose by those uh, non-invasive techniques. And it's very cost effective, we don't have to go to the hospital to do all the testing, right? But the thing is, with those kind of uh, measurements, is there are a lot of noise, and some of them not well validated. So like we do research in type 1 diabetes, we have all the well-controlled clinical trials, we have well-defined variables, and we have all the literature, and we also can connect the results with uh, the bench side, basic research, right? But here, for those commercial available device, 
their measurement and noisy, and they sometimes they, they don't have those clinical validate concepts. So how can we actually um, um, utilize those monitoring tools to help us monitor patient better, but also we can control the quality. So here is how we uh, look at this. So for a person, with the measurement is the, uh, this velvet device, whatever measurement it is, but it's correlated with one choose measurements. Let's say for diabetes, h one b one c is actually not measured, but it's actually happening in, in, in the body. We cannot measure that, but we can refer the patient back to the hospital to get the uh, well validated testing of the of the condition. Right. So this is actually from uh, a state space model. So in the later part, we have all the physiological signal evolving over time, but on the uh, observation side, we have those uh, sensors. And what new problem we have here is, you know, state space model has been well studied in a lot of areas like manufacturing those areas. But more, what's interesting here is we can actually refer patients back to hospital and we can have their latent variables measured, right? So this creates an inspection problem, which means if we monitor a patient based on the wearable device and we can, each time we, uh, we want to prioritize the patient to go back to the hospital, take what kind of measurements, you can based on this um, statistic correlations and then you can identify which measurement you should take. So this is, we go into the literature and we didn't really identify works related to that because in the past, probably this is not a practical uh, problem to inspect some data variables. So this is actually a, a new method we can create. Uh, there's analytic problems we can actually do. So this is the, um, the, uh, the other work I want to share. Question. In the yep. work with detecting uh, latent variables or yep. inspecting latent variables, what is the objective for that decision making problem of inspection? Is That's a good question. And yeah. the health component mm -hmm. mm -hmm. combined with the different. So, right now in this paper, we just concern like, the, uh, the, the accuracy in estimating the latent variables. Mm -hmm. So, like, based on this uh, cheap measurement, can we have a good confident understanding of the uh, underlying physiological measures? But definitely, we can also formulate if, let's say, your glucose level is critically low, then what can happen? So that's clearly another goal. Yeah. Questions? Right, so those are the uh, things. So for a conclusion, I c my conclusion is uh, a little bit lengthy. I have a, a few more slides. So uh, so this is the uh, one slide I want to uh, compare with, uh, like, what's the, uh, um, it's actually a, uh, a thing we have been doing for all of the centuries, which is how we can actually establish a norm for a um, for, for person, and then we how we can actually derive, identify the derivations, then we call disease. So this is uh, a practice we have been doing all these years. Like uh, like for this one, this is uh, like the police used actually in the uh, early 19th centuries, and they actually have, a, they have the kind of a dictionary of the human phrase it's kind of like the codified phrase expression I introduced in the depression case, but this is back before the computer age. So we can actually categorize the human face traits and then you identify what's what's the norm there. But nowadays we have these smartphones, so we can have a, a lot of data sets, and how we can actually establish the norm and uh, establish the derivation is really a real challenge. So this is actually a very interesting problem we should look at. So, as a consequence, uh, it actually gives us new opportunities to help uh, do healthcare research uh, to ask really big questions. So, for example, Alzheimer disease. So, uh, Alzheimer disease, as we know that, uh, we have a, a formal definition of what is Alzheimer's disease. Like, if you go to the DSM, uh, the latest version, you can actually have the rigorous definition, like this patient has an MMS score lower than this value, and if this patient has this pattern uh, quantified, then you can conclude this patient is uh, Alzheimer's disease. But if you look at the, um, our state-of-the-art understanding of the disease, the diagnosis is really the end of this disease. So, which means if a person is diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease, there's not much we can do. And also, it's just part of the process. So before that, we have all the things happening, like in the beginning, we have the, uh, the protein level, the amyloids uh, have become toxic in the brain because the brain lost the function to clean out those uh, proteins, so they aggregate, become toxic. But we can use a new energy technique to scan that, and after that, those proteins impact your function, so we can use PET scan to detect that, 
and out of that, you still, if you still do nothing, the function is uh, the function is function of brain. We are damaging the structure, so you see a lot of things happen. So basically, the question is now: What is actually Alzheimer's disease? If we know a decade earlier, this person is going to have Alzheimer's disease, then our diagnosis should be made a decade earlier. In that time, your brain still have all the neurons, have all the intuitions, so we can do a lot of things to prevent uh, the disease become worse and worse. So the same thing is also happening in other disease. The reason I talk about Alzheimer's disease and type 1 diabetes is because I work in these areas. So for type 1 diabetes, we are also have a, a, the state of the art understanding of the disease is illustrated like here. We are, in the beginning, we have all the beta cell mass for this, uh, for this kid, and over time, the environmental triggers probably is a virus infection or probably just a cold. Uh, we don't know yet. But somehow trigger that, so the new system trying to kill your beta cell as a virus, so you get less and less and less, and a lot of things happened, and you can see a lot of our physiological uh, markers for that. So now we also think about the question is, is type 1 diabetes one disease or many, many diseases? Yeah. So if you think about the history of a diabetes, um, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, they were known as diabetes. So until people realize there is one particular diabetes for kids, so they're very really young when they have the diabetes. So then they realize type 1 diabetes is quite different because it has a genetic component here. So it's more like a load of the gum. And the question is when and what treatment the gum. So it's totally different questions we ask. So in this case, in all the data sets and uh, all the devices we have, uh, the question is how we can actually do this. So we have so many questions and you can make a, a, a big impact if you are really go into this area and it's just to look at this, we really find out. So, uh, we, uh, so I mean, uh, for system engineering, we uh, look at uh, the data set. We hopefully to look at the system. So nowadays, we have so many data set, but always there is a system merge. Like if you think about a dice, it's a stick space. If you slow the dice, it's a totally random. So it's nothing you can gain with that. But if you slow two and you define the outcome from one to twelve, you graduate the uh, central tendency, right? So if we slow more of all, more of them, you see this is a normal curve, right? So this is how we can actually uh, aggregate the information and we create uh, the systems already there. It's not created by you, but just to able to recognize that. So other things is, um, one thing I want to share is, uh, to analyze the data in healthcare is, is challenging, but it's quite rewarding. It's just like, sometimes the data is not good enough, but you have to impute your data analysis with a good hypothesis. So this is a story, uh, some of you may already know that. If you know that, then spoil it, okay? <laughs> yeah. So this is a, uh, it's a story in World War II, and uh, uh, the Allied Air Force trying to armor their aircraft up because uh, uh, they're trying to basically try to uh, enhance some particular parts of the airplane. So they hired a statistician called Abraham Ward. So he actually stayed in the, uh, the runway trying to catalog catalog the bullet holes on the returning airplanes, and this is what she observed. So then they had a meeting, and they decide to which part she arm up. He cannot arm every place up, because that would create a lot of uh, make your plan heavy, so you lost performance, right? So you can only select a few spots. So look at this pattern, which place you want to enhance. Someone want to give a try? The wings, possibly. The wings, why? It's like on the outer edges of the wings is pretty common. Target. Yeah, yes. Okay, so uh, do you suggest like those areas? Okay, good effort. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is he needed to study the planes that didn't come back because those are the ones that were shot down. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So. Because they survived these shots. Yes, yeah. So that means if you hit by those places, probably fine because they came back. But if you hit by those places, the chance is really low. So we should have enhanced those parts. So you see, a pilot actually sits here. So if you get hit by in this place, you uh, lost the pen. So this is actually the way we are uh, analyze the data set. It's not just to uh, uh, fit a data set into any algorithm, but say, I mean, consider the context, the background and that makes a difference.
but you're not alone. You know, the board actually decided to uh, um, enhance their powers. So this is the first impression for her. So another thing is uh, communication is very, very important with your uh, ex, uh, um, uh, collaborator. So this is uh, a graph from my paper, uh, my students. Uh, we, we work with uh, some of these uh, uh, experts. So uh, the idea is, as I mentioned, amyloid is the protein which the hypothesis is our loss of capacity to clean this protein from the brain actually cause Alzheimer's disease. That's the leading hypothesis right now. So a lot of uh, clinical trials trying to clean this amyloid. So that's a major effort of, of, of a lot of pharmaceutical companies. So another question is, if you have a, a new drug, you want to demonstrate that you can clean the uh, protein, you need to recruit people who have those amyloids in their brain and that's their normal people. So where do you find those people? You have to uh, go into a database of uh, a hospital system or somewhere, and they identify the patient participant, and they call them to your center, scan their brain, right? But a typical PET scan costs you 3,000, and you know that your throughput rate is probably really low, but maybe just 5% of them are really positive. So before we put them to the PET scan, we actually are uh, um, my collaborators think uh, maybe we can do blood measurements, which cost only like 200. And we can, if you can predict the brain amyloid in the, uh, based on the blood, we can actually uh, uh, save a lot of money because you can prioritize your uh, scan, right? So we build a decision tree model, and the accuracy is uh, disappointingly low, which is only 6%. You can detect those amyloid patients uh, who really have the positive. But still, we publish the paper <laughs> because Although overall the accuracy is low, but you can look at the details, for some particular subgroups, the accuracy is really high. So it still has value, even for 6% prediction, but for some subgroups, you all have a very good prediction. But for those troublemakers, we, we don't have a capacity there, but we have capacity otherwise. Right? So, uh, so, so then easily drop a topic, but uh, you probably will see something along the way. That's what uh, I want to share today. Thanks. I, I have great cards, by the way. <laughs> Card, when you come in <laughs> for, for Emily, is going to be with little scraps of paper everywhere. So just a reminder, when you first come in, grab an index card. Just make our life easier. Um, but there are great questions on the not-so-great pieces of paper, so don't be shy. I'll call some of you out if people are too shy. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, I got the sense that for a lot of this research, it sounds like you need to be familiar with a lot of medical terms and the stages of depression and Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Would you recommend to industrial engineers and operations researchers who want to work in healthcare, would you recommend that they have some medical background and that they take some courses and medical courses, just to become more familiar with those terms? Uh, I feel like it's different. Um, but like for me, I never took a medical course before, but I, I do uh, read a lot of papers for, uh, to understand what's in the data set and then what people already done with the data set. And um, another important thing is you can help with your collaborators. So you can join their lab to do uh, some interns and yeah, just get a feeling about uh, how they interpret the results. Yeah. For your multimodal depression mm -hmm. um, screen, did you have to deal with um, maybe more missing data from one mode than the other, and uh, you adjust the weights when things like that happen? That's a, that's a good question. So for this particular data set, we don't have to do that because uh, it's collected by a, 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 a computation organizer, so everything is controlled. But in, uh, in the another data set is the Alzheimer's Disease Reimaging Initiative. Uh, we lost data points for different reasons. So you do have to consider uh, what's the weight for different modalities. Yeah. And I believe those weights probably, um, you could use a weight for all the people, but probably different because it depends on stage. Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of good questions, don't be shy. Yeah. Um, for the outpatient mm -hmm. monitoring, what would you use to learn to more completely digital? Like, what are the aspects that you could not quantify the methodology? Could you elaborate more about the problem? 
Um, you said that like some people in your background, which is not having like, a computer background, yeah. both had the same level of detection. Yeah. So like, what was the problem there? Or is it maybe just a problem with detection in general? The problem is, in general, it's very hard. Like, uh, if you look at the own uh, pattern, even for different surgeons, they look at that, they get different results. And also, we ask, uh, it's also documented in the literature, like, uh, what defines, what makes your mind, for a surgeon, what makes your mind if you decide there is an infection going on, and also they have a disagreement. But the one thing they look at is like the redness of the, uh, the skin, uh, those kind of things. But generally, the problem is really hard. Yeah. So one of the questions that a lot of people raise, but aren't raising, so I'll raise, is privacy issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what your your experience, your talks with your collaborators, your perspective on the issue of collecting all of this data um, and patient privacy. Yeah, that's definitely a very important aspect. I I don't have a solution for that, but I can tell you what I suffered. Like for the uh, this Empower app, we already collect a lot of data, but my collaborator haven't given me the data yet. So we use the public available data set for research purpose right now. But uh, I agree, I mean, privacy is a uh, is very important issue before we dive into the technology. That's one thing we have to uh, take care of. Yeah. I want to make sure we have a little time for you to work on your group projects. And all of you who are too shy to ask your questions are going to promptly go up and ask your questions. So I'll leave a little time for that. But we have a small gift for you. Wow. And thank you again well, for thanks. coming to speak with us. Thank you.